Well, okay. <clears throat> Here we are, one in the word for week 76, uh, Thursday, October 14th, 2021. And we will focus on the lessons for the coming Sunday, which is uh, the coming weekend, October 16th and 17th. And uh, these are the lessons, Isaiah 53, 4 to 12, which should be familiar to a lot of people. Uh, Hebrews 5, 1 to 10, uh, also uh, interacts with uh, Holy Week, uh, Good Friday in particular. And then uh, Mark 10, 35 to 45. And that's about warnings to ambitious disciples. So that's what we've got here. We have a small crew on hand here at, at the church, uh, but we go for quality. So we have a good crew. Uh, and this is a lesson uh, from Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 12. Uh, Vicar, would you like to read that? Absolutely. <clears throat> Isaiah 53, 4 through 12. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before it cheers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make, when you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Okay. <clears throat> Well, this is a, uh, a very familiar uh, prophecy from the uh, prophet Isaiah, one of the servant songs. And it uh, <clears throat> has uh, historically been interpreted as uh, being in a uh, description of Jesus and his suffering and death. Mm -hmm. um, in its original context and writing to Isaiah, uh, one wonders exactly you know, how the people might have heard it back in those days uh, when Isaiah was uh, publishing this particular message. Uh, because, of course, in those days, they didn't know about Jesus, and uh, uh, so they couldn't read into it. Uh, they had to take it on its uh, face value and try to figure out what this is all about. Having said that, um, the general approach that I'm familiar with is to think of this as being <clears throat> related to uh, the whole nation of Israel. And so the he is Israel. Israel has borne our infirmities, carried our diseases, that we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and so on. This is a uh, um, portion of the book of Isaiah that comes during that time when um, the people of Israel uh, had already been in exile. And so the question was, uh, how do we make any sense out of the um, suffering that we're going through? Uh, and we can get to that in a minute when we think about its application to us today. Um, but here um, the prophet says, uh, this is punishment. But the punishment made us whole. 
and by his bruises, we are healed. And then goes on to, and to confess, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So the whole nation is going to suffer uh, because of the, or is suffering, let's put it that way, because of the uh, sinfulness of the nation. Uh, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, and he opened not his mouth. Uh, like a lamb led to slaughter, like a sheep before it shares in silence. So he was silent, did not open his mouth. Uh, by a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Now there again, that's, um, if you think of this in terms of the exile of Israel, uh, liter literally of Judah, um, they are being taken away. And what future did they have? Who could have imagined the future of the people of Judah when they were taken away? Even though it was a punishment for their sins, uh, the question certainly arose, uh, you know, so where is this all going to, uh, where, where is this going to end? And how is there going to be a better future? Cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Um, stricken for the transgression of my people. What? This was when the Israelites went into the desert. I didn't hear all that. Was it when the Israelites went into the desert? No, this is when they went to Babylon. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So this is much later on. This is after they had they had already uh, established the nation. They had expanded their borders under King David's reign. Mm -hmm. uh, they had defeated many of their enemies and so on. But then the northern kingdom and southern kingdom uh, were created as because of a split. Uh, northern kingdom was decimated by the Assyrians, and uh, many of them were taken away. Uh, and dispersed into other nations, uh, virtually disappearing from the face of the earth as a, a, a integrated body. And now you have uh, this situation where uh, the Southern Kingdom uh, is likewise being um, stricken for their transgressions. Uh, they made his grave with the wicked, his tomb with the rich. Though he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. It was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. What a word of uh, unexpected hope. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. So this is really a, a message of hope at this point, mm -hmm. saying that because of the, the suffering that uh, uh, they have endured, uh, they, the time is coming when they will prosper. Um, they will live longer lives. They will uh, see light and find satisfaction, gain knowledge, and many will become righteous or made right with God. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring, shall prolong his days. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, it's kind of a offspring, the children of Israel. Yeah, 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 their descendants and so on. Mm -hmm. But you know, but the I think the the irony that you're picking up on there is that uh, usually when when someone is given as an offering for sin, there is no future. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, here this is a word of hope saying uh, he may be offered up for. Um, for sin or because of sin, uh, nevertheless, uh, he will have offspring mm -hmm. and they will continue 
you know, to have an impact uh, and, and prosper. Would the word offspring refer to a disciples? I, I think it's the whole nation, I think. Oh, okay. All the nation of Israel, even up until today, for that matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, all those who are descendants of Abraham um, uh, shall prosper. And um, I will allot him a portion with the great, shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, was numbered with the transgressors for the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, this is the way the, uh, the text reads. The thing that strikes me about it, of course, is the fact that it, uh, it does fit so well into the way the story is told about Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. I'm going to pull out my Bible here. While you're doing yeah. that, I just mm -hmm. want to say that this, yeah. this passage is really the one that has the most influence on me out of, I think, probably out of the Old Testament, uh, the, the whole Old Testament. And um, I, I do try to picture it as how the Jewish people would read it without going directly to Jesus. It's very, it's very difficult because... <laughs> You know, it's it just, there's so much here that sounds like Jesus. Yeah. yeah. And, um, more than anywhere else in the Old Testament, in my opinion. This is a, this is a prophecy. Yeah. And like Pastor was saying, it's, it's uh, the servant could be uh, the nation of Israel. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's also maybe a messiah, a messianic prophecy before Jesus. That's one, one, that's one way I've heard, but um, it's it sounds like past tense. By the star with the strong, because he put out himself to death. That sounds like history. Right. Like it's already happened. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's how a prophet interprets things, too. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, you know, sometimes they're, they're looking forward and saying, this is what I see in the future, a visionary. But other, way, other times they are interpreting what people cannot understand. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very important role that the prophet played. Mm -hmm. What I like is that there is, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the things they found was the great Isaiah scroll. And the great Isaiah scroll had this passage in it. Of course, you know, it has all of Isaiah. Yes. And it's older than, it's like 200 um, BC. Mm -hmm. So all these things we know for a fact, we actually have a copy that's older than when Christ was born. Mm -hmm. So all this, like he was numbered with our transgressors, died for the sins of many. That's all was written down before Jesus was born. And it's not like we have to take that as somebody's telling us that. Like we know for a fact that, you know, there is this book that's older than Jesus. And it's saying all the things that Jesus is going to do. But then Isaiah didn't write it. Well, there are different different sections of Isaiah. Yeah. So this is considered to be the second Isaiah. So yeah, it would be a different Isaiah mm -hmm. uh, tradition. Yeah. But still long before oh, yeah. the first century. Yeah. Well, part of the background of this text also is the fact that um, there was this understanding that, uh, that uh, the king uh, would um, be the one who would bring about um, the healing and the reconciliation of the nation. Mm -hmm. And so he, he will take on himself the suffering of his people. And because of his, uh, because of his suffering, uh, he becomes a substitutionary atonement, so to speak. He is, uh, he is solving the problem uh, for everyone else um, by his sacrifice. 
And, you know, again, I, I can't help but jump into the 21st century immediately and say, you know, uh, are, is that the way leaders function in the 21st century? Uh, are they willing to make sacrifices on, the, on behalf of the people, especially uh, with regard to the errors and the sins of the people in the past? Uh, and right now we have a very ironic situation where much of the suffering is uh, not being resolved, but exacerbated. So it's uh, kind of interesting. I think pastors would be willing to do that. Pastors are leaders. Yeah, I, I think pastors do suffer on behalf of the whole congregation. Certainly, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it just kind of anecdotally, you know, there are an awful lot of pastors who uh, who serve full time pastoral ministries, and uh, and while serving, of course, they are not often compensated, mm -hmm. uh, even at the level or the standard that the synod sets or the guidelines, yeah. and uh, and so. You know, the congregation may be suffering because of lack of resources, but the, uh, the leader of that congregation, the pastor, uh, you know, feels it most uh, succinctly or most closely because it has to do with this very standard of living and so on. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, when we associate this with Jesus, of course, then you kind of have a... Uh, a retelling of uh, the story of Jesus. Yeah. You know, uh, this is the interpretation. You know, if you think about it for a moment, uh, in the early church, as they uh, dealt with the reality of, of the uh, betrayal, the trial, condemnation, uh, brutal beating that Jesus endured, and then finally his crucifixion. Uh, and he's crucified between two thieves, one on his right and one on his left. Kind of interesting even there, because that uh, kind of that phrase connects us with the gospel lesson later on. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, here we see uh, the, uh, the as the early church looked at this at uh, the story of what happened to Jesus, they couldn't help but see this as interpreting. Yeah what's really taking, pl taking place, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So he was stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. Think about how serious that is, to be struck down by God. Uh, and this is a servant of God, you know, whether it be Israel or Jesus. Mm -hmm. Wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Again, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense from, from a rational point of view to say that somebody else should suffer punishment and endure suffering and pain for people who are guilty of something, you know, uh, in their place, <clears throat> substitutionary atonement. <clears throat> there is a whole article here, and uh, it says Israelites provided substitutionary atonement for wrongs ordinarily through animal sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Human substitution is much rarer. One example, is a substitute king known from Mesopotamian texts of the early uh, second through the first millennia BC, uh, with most examples from the time of the Assyrian king Ezra Haddon, early seventh century BC. This was precipitated by an omen, generally an eclipse, that predicted the demise of the king. In order to save himself from this uh, fate, he temporarily removed himself from the throne and enthroned an expendable substitute conscripted for that purpose. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is they, they literally pick out somebody who is as a close double to the king mm -hmm. and they uh, dress him up. Yes. And put him on the throne, and so on and so forth, wow. uh, so that when his uh, when he is offered up as a sacrifice, you know, then uh, everything settles down for the people. Wow. Now, at the end of the period, the substitute was put in put to death, so that the uh, 
evident design of the gods would be accomplished. The omens had suggested that it was the will of the gods to crush him. As one text puts it, he died to save the living and the crown prince, the king and the crown prince, mm. but his sacrifice is also understood to accomplish redemption for the people. The substitute king and his queen were put to death, carrying the fate of the God king, uh, of the real king upon himself. He was given a rich state funeral, an offering was made, and exorcisms, uh, rituals were performed, including washings and sprinklings, so that the omens would be canceled and the days of the king could be prolonged. The substitute king and his queen were led, uh, were laid to rest in a royal tomb with accompanying ritual. So that's, they literally had this way of dealing with these omens that came along, which are not that frequent. Um, but the omen predicted that, you know, there's gonna be disaster. So the king was gonna to have to take the brunt of it. That's kind of a scary thought. So even though it wasn't really the king, he had like a royal funeral. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, it was a great big show, right? They put on this show, this uh, uh, <laughs> substitute action, yeah. So the lords or the gods, you know, uh, are pleased that the king is uh, sacrificed, but of course the king survives. <laughs> yeah. We're talking about pagans here, are we not? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. right. But it could have been like, well, I mean, if Israel is in Babylon at this time, then right. it's like a pagan area. And you're, they're always getting in trouble for the surrounding places influencing their culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Yeah, and, and the irony of the passage, of course, is that, that um, in spite of the fact that this scenario is being lived out, um, there's a different outcome. Mm. And the outcome is that uh, uh, the righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Uh, I will allot him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. Uh, he bore the sin of many, made in intercession for the transgressors. So <clears throat> the substitution brings about a positive outcome uh, mm -hmm. for the people of um, Judah in this particular case. Um, that becomes kind of a, uh, a way of thinking about the meaning of the death of Jesus. So we wind up with a, um, a theological uh, position called the substitutionary atonement, uh, which actually was originated by Saint Anselm, I think around the 12th century. And so, um, you know, just like you would take a, a, a goat and you place all the sins on the goat right. and then send him out into the wilderness as a scapegoat, mm -hmm. right? He escapes as a goat, takes away your sins. Well, here the uh, same kind of process is uh, described um, with the assumption that the leader is going to bear the, uh, the brunt of the sins of the people. So when we think about um, that, um, in terms of connection with our text and contemporary setting, it becomes a very interesting uh, thing to think about, uh, especially when we think about uh, those who are leaders or rulers over the, over the people in our generation. Um, You know, if you think about it, regardless of the politics of the moment, um, it is not uncommon for people in authority to uh, put somebody else up to bear the brunt of it. 
So there are other people who are offered as scapegoats, are other people who suffer uh, at, you know, as substitutes, mm -hmm. substitutes for the, uh, for the one who is uh, supposed to bear the brunt of it. So when somebody says the buck stops here uh, and then goes on to blame everybody else for doing something, mm -hmm. uh, well then uh, you really have the same kind of dynamic going on. Yes. You know, uh, the big difference, of course, is uh, the question of are, are we being healed as a result? Does healing come about or, uh, or not? Uh, in the case of the Isaiah text, um, it was that the people would be healed. The people are healed, the offenders, although they they don't seem to receive punishment, ultimately do. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You know, ultimately, you know, it's just that when you're in the midst of it, um, it that's only kind of a yeah. consolation. It's not even a, it's not even a word of hope because after the damage is done, uh, you know, what value does punishment have? You know, it's like with this, uh, with this gal who was uh, killed out there in Wyoming, a girl from Long Island. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, the time will come when they'll catch the guy and uh, they'll make a case against him. And if he's the one that's guilty of killing her, yeah. he'll be punished. But that won't bring her back. It doesn't, yeah. it won't bring her back and it won't really heal very much, no. you know? No. And so punishment doesn't necessarily heal. Right. Um, it's one of the... Well, well kind of, this, this kind of goes with that. Um, mm -hmm. So it starts at verse four, but verse three is one that I really like. Okay. It says, he was, he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with pain. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and went, and we esteemed him not. And what I get from that, because we're talking about like contemporary and stuff, I think about that as Jesus. And it's very comforting to know that Christ has been through, like when we're going through something, something mm -hmm. it's very comforting to know that christ has already been through it and he's been through worse mm -hmm. and he's familiar with what we're going through yeah and yeah very yeah and, and that that goes to the second lesson actually where uh in it's in the he, right. book of hebrews it virtually says exactly what you're saying yeah that jesus as our great high priest has suffered you know, uh, it focuses on his weakness rather than his strength, uh, his suffering rather than his power or control. Uh, and uh, again, it is a, it's a su surprising concept. Yeah, it's so different. From, yeah, yeah. What it's not what expect. we expect from our heroes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, all right, we go into Hebrews, and now we have. Yeah. Uh, the introductory video. I'm going to uh, get this up there for you. We could talk about that Isaiah passage all day, I think. <laughs> yeah, well. Got to move on eventually. There's a lot of more stuff that can be brought into it. The letter to the Hebrews. The author of this letter is anonymous, and people have wondered for a long time whether Paul wrote it or maybe one of his co-workers like Barnabas or Apollos, but really we just don't know. In chapter 2, we discover that the author had a first-hand relationship with the disciples who were themselves around Jesus, so we know that this letter is anchored in the teaching of the apostles. We also don't know who the audience of this letter was or even where they lived. The author knows them really well, and he assumes that they have a thorough knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures, especially the storyline of the first 
first five books of the Bible, the Torah, about how Abraham's family became the nation of Israel, about how Moses led them out of slavery in Egypt to Mount Sinai, where they received the Torah and they made a covenant with God, where they built the tabernacle, where the priests offered sacrifices, and also about how they wandered through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. The author just expects that the readers know all of the details about these stories. And so most likely the audience is made up of Jewish Christians. That's where the name of the letter comes from. We also have clues from chapter 10 that this church community was facing persecution and even imprisonment because of their association with Jesus. Some in the community were walking away from Jesus and abandoning the faith altogether. And this explains the purpose and the structure of this letter. First, there's a short introduction, which is followed by four sections where the author compares and contrasts Jesus with key people and events from Israel's history. Jesus <laughs> is first compared with angels in the Torah, second with Moses and the Promised Land, third with priests and Melchizedek, and lastly with the sacrifices and the covenant. And the author has two main goals in all of these contrasts. The first goal is to elevate Jesus as superior to anyone or anything else, showing that Jesus is worthy of all their trust and devotion. But his second goal is this, it's to challenge the readers to remain faithful to Jesus despite persecution. So in every section, he includes a strong warning not to abandon Jesus. So let's dive in now and see how this all unfolds. The elevation of Jesus begins in the opening sentence of the introduction. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors in many different ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. So the author saying that Jesus is superior to all of the previous ways that God has revealed himself to Israel. He then makes this astounding claim that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's nature. These metaphors are making the closest possible identification between Jesus and God. So Jesus is what the rays of light are to the sun, or Jesus is what the wax impression is to the signet ring. For this author, there is no God apart from Jesus. Jesus is God become human as the Son. And it's this elevated view of Jesus that's then explored throughout the rest of the letter. In the first section, the author compares Jesus with angels, which might strike you as kind of odd, like why angels? In Jewish tradition, it was taught based on Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse two, that the Torah and the words of God were delivered to Moses at Mount Sinai by angels. And so by saying that Jesus is superior to angels, the author is claiming that Jesus and his message of good news are superior to all previous messengers of God's word. And so the first warning flows from this very point. If Israel was called to pay attention to the Torah that was delivered by angels, how much more should we pay attention to the message that was announced by the Son of God? And not only that, given Jesus' status high above the angels, how remarkable is it that he gave up that high status to become human, to suffer, and to die? In Jesus, we see God's greatest glory and God's great humility as Jesus sympathetically joined himself to humanity's tragic fate. In chapters 3 and 4, the author moves on to argue that Jesus is superior to Moses, who led the people of Israel through the wilderness and built the tabernacle. Jesus is also the leader of God's people, but in him we see not the builder of just a tent, but of all creation. Then the author retells the story of how the Israelites rebelled against Moses in the wilderness, and they lost their chance to enter into the rest that God offered them in the promised land. And so here comes the second warning. If Jesus is greater than Moses, how much higher are the stakes if we rebel against him? We also are in a wilderness-like environment where we have to trust God for the future rest in God's new creation. So let's make sure that we don't rebel like Israel did in the wilderness and lose out on God's gracious offer to enter his new creation. In chapters five through seven, the author then compares Jesus with Israel's priests that come from the line of Aaron. Their role was to represent Israel before God and to offer sacrifices that atoned for or covered over the sins of the people. But, he points out, the priests were themselves morally flawed people, and so they constantly had to offer sacrifices for their own sins as well as for everybody else's. Something more was needed. And so he then argues that Jesus was that something more. He's the ultimate priest. But Jesus did not come from the line of Aaron. Rather, Jesus was a priest in the order of Melchizedek that mysterious priest king from ancient Jerusalem, and he appears in the stories about Abraham. 
We also find in Psalm 110 that the messianic king from the line of David will be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. So the author's whole point is this. Jesus is the ultimate priest king. He's morally flawless. He's eternally available for his people. And so he's superior to any other mediator between God and humans. And thus comes his warning in this section. To reject Jesus is to reject one's best and only chance to be fully reconciled to God. So don't do that which transitions us into the last comparison in chapters 8 through 10. The author shows how Jesus' death on the cross was the ultimate sacrifice superior to all the animal sacrifices offered in the temple. Those sacrifices had to be offered constantly, both daily but also yearly on the Day of Atonement. Jesus offered his life once and for all, and it was sufficient to cover the sins of the whole world. And so the author warns the audience from walking away from Jesus. It's like turning your back on a gracious offer of God's forgiveness. Why would you do that? Jesus' sacrifice is permanent, he says, and it's the foundation for the new covenant spoken of in the prophets, where all sins are forgiven. So now that the author has elevated Jesus through all of these contrasts, this final section is one big challenge to follow Jesus. So think big picture. In Jesus, they have found God's very word. In Jesus, they have hope for the new creation. Jesus is their eternal priest. He's the perfect sacrifice. And so now they should follow all the great models of faith found throughout the story of the scriptures, and they should remain faithful to Jesus, trusting that despite whatever hardship and persecution, God will not abandon his people. That's the basic flow of thought throughout the letter, which the author calls right here at the very end, a brief word of exhortation. Here's a couple of extra tips for reading this letter. Whenever the author quotes from the Old Testament scriptures, which is like every other sentence, stop and go look up the reference and read that quotation in its original context. And sometimes you'll be puzzled, but more often you'll see all kinds of extra cool connections that you would never notice otherwise. It's totally worth the effort. You should also just know that these warning passages, they're going to make you uncomfortable, and that's kind of the point. They're not there to make you afraid. They're there to show you that rejecting Jesus is foolish because he's so awesome. These warnings all serve the larger purpose of the letter, to show that Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God's love and mercy. And that's what the letter of the Hebrews is all about. Okay. Got it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. There it is in a nutshell. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hebrews 5, 1 to 10. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. But because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. One does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. All right, so that's uh, the entire passage in three slides. Any comments about things that you, that you heard or read uh, as you looked at that? Well, it does talk about Melchizedek. Yeah. So I will be very interested to see how, uh, how you deal with that on Sunday. Are you going to talk about Melchizedek? 
I don't know. Yeah, I, I know you don't know yet, but I'll be, I wouldn't know how to handle that. Um, well, just as by way of background, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Melchizedek is an Old Testament priest of Salem who uh, interacted with uh, Abraham. And uh, Abraham, uh, recognizing his uh, stature and authority and so on, uh, gave him a tithe. Mm. And that's really the beginning of the, of the reference to the concept of tithing mm. uh, and giving an offering uh, to God uh, by giving an offering to the priest. So, okay. so Abraham, when he met Melchizedek, Abraham saw that how great Melchizedek was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which is, wow. Uh, I'm wondering here if we can see chapter five or six. It's interesting, there's no reference here to Melchizedek uh, in Genesis. Yeah, Genesis. Hmm. Uh, one would have to go back into the story of Abraham and Melchizedek. Well, that's kind of a yeah. concordance type project. Let's just see. Yeah, so there was this priest, the priest of Salem. That's uh, how he's identified. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, later on, uh, Salem is known as Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. um, and so it takes on... Uh, a special meaning in that sense. Right, there was no Jerusalem at that time. It wasn't, it was much earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, and really his point is, he's talking about how the priesthood is the line of Aaron. And then he says, but think about this guy, Melchizedek, who we don't know anything about who his father was or who his mother was, or even about his family afterwards. He mm -hmm. comes along and Abraham recognizes him as a priest. Yeah. And that's how that all comes about. Yeah, it's Genesis 14. There you go. Genesis 14, verses uh, 18 and to 20. So we'll take a quick look at that. These pages are so thin, it's hard to separate them. All right. 18 through 20. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem. So he's not just a priest, right. but he's also a king. Right. And that's significant, too. Oh, yeah. uh, the two roles are combined. Mm -hmm. uh, brought out bread and wine. Mm -hmm. He was priest of God Most High. Mm -hmm. And he blessed Abram. Now, this is before Abram becomes Abraham. Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the other significance about uh, Melchizedek, of course, is that uh, he precedes Aaron uh, and the Aaronic uh, priesthood uh, by centuries, many centuries. So um, uh, that makes him kind of, uh, uh, well, he's, he's, more, he's superior to uh, Aaron and the priest, priesthood of Aaron. Yeah. Uh, and so that's uh, important. Yeah, yeah. What, what what I really like. So he's a priest and a king, mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. can't like the priest came from one tribe of Israel, and the kings came from another. Mm -hmm. So who is this guy, this mysterious Melchizedek, all the way back in Genesis, who comes along, and it says he's both the priest and the king, which is not allowed. <laughs> it's really fascinating. Well, it was, maybe it was allowed at that time. 
but not in the future. Those roles were separated in the future. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that could be. Well, it but does yeah. eventually because, uh, you know, Israel goes to having a king with Samuel. And um, at that point, they're looking, uh, they're looking for a ruler. Yeah, king, yeah. Yeah, and so that's the uh, job description, you might say, that uh, was at work uh, for Israel. There was also somebody in there whose name starts with a G. I can't remember what it was that came along in that same period of time. Gamora? No, no. Well, there was Gideon. That's with a G. And a very no. unusual name. Unpronounceable. One of those. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's names. a bunch of kings. There's right, like, I think it's a chapter before that. There's this war with kings that all oh, have strange names. That might be what you mean. The footnote here about the bread and wine, it's unclear whether these are shared by all of Abram's men or just the council in, in council between Melchizedek uh, and the victorious commanders. It would seem to be a meager fare if the uh, latter were the case. Abram's success has signaled the possibility of a major shift of power in the region, and it appears that Melchizedek is taking the opportunity of the army of the army's return to explore what ambition or loyalties Abram might have had. It was common for a meal to be shared when treaty negotiations were being finalized. But generally, meat was part of the meal uh, as sacrifices were made in association with oaths uh, uh, to the respective deities and so on. Um, so, you know, the God Most High, uh, that's the description that's given to God in this passage. All right, another. Um, the high priest is able to deal, well, all right. Uh, he, he's chosen from among mortals, put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf. It's kind of an interesting um, way of describing uh, the role of a pastor. Uh, the pastor is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that next phrase is what, it, what, it, what that means, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. So the, the job of the priest is to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins on behalf of the people. So when they say every high priest chosen, who was doing the choosing? The people? Was it? Uh, the Sanhedrin. Yeah, the leadership. The leadership. Yeah, the council. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there were high priests, and then they would choose someone to be high priest, and uh, and then the successors, and so on. He's able to deal gently with the ignorant, wayward, since he himself is subject to weakness. Uh, that's uh, again kind of a uh, offhanded way of uh, talking about uh, Jesus suffering uh, or being subject to weakness subject to temptation as well, uh, but not falling to temptation. Because of this, the uh, high priest must offer sacrifice for his own sins, as well as for those of the people. Hmm. And number four, verse four, is also kind of interesting. One does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, hmm. all right? Hmm. And that has uh, found its way very strongly into uh, Christian understanding of uh, uh, the pastoral ministry. Um, you know, if someone has a call from God, they have at least the beginning of uh, preparation for ordination, you might say. Uh, and conversely, if someone does not have any sense of being called by God, they're really not suitable mm -hmm. as uh, spiritual leaders, okay? 
they may have very well, uh, they may be equipped to handle other functions, but uh, not that one. So Christ did not uh, choose this. Uh, he did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed. Appointed by the one who said, you are my son today, I've begotten you. Well, that's the, the voice of God, of course. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Again, that's in contrast to uh, uh, yeah. high priests that come and go. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So this priest offers sacrifice perpetually. Mm -hmm. You know, the Catholics have uh, this um, yeah. phrase uh, pertaining to Mary, Our Lady of Perpetual Help, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but in reality, uh, you know, the biblical tradition is that Jesus is the one of perpetual uh, intercession on behalf of the people of God. He offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. I think, um, you know, there uh, seems to be a reference there to the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, to the one who was able to save him from death. Loud cries and tears. You know, in the, in the uh, Church of All Nations in Jerusalem, it's on the Mount of Olives. And um, when you walk into the church, uh, as you approach the altar, uh, there is, a, uh, there is a, a structure made out of metal that, that is uh, circular. And uh, it's more or less like a, a, a small fence. Okay, maybe oh, 18 inches high at most. Uh, and you see that and you say, what, what in the world is that, you know? And then you look in the inside that circle and what you see is uh, some bare stone, okay? And that stone that you see there, um, uh, according to tradition now, is the, uh, the place where Jesus uh, prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Wow. And that stone that is there is what remains of the stone that Jesus knelt beside. Because that huge stone has been chipped and chipped and chipped and chipped away for centuries upon centuries. And so now they just have that, that little fence around it, which when you look more carefully at it, is a crown of thorns around the rock, okay? So it's a, a very symbolic uh, uh, mm -hmm. location, and it's right there. I mean, you can't look at the altar without seeing the crown of thorns and, and the rock where Jesus interceded. So the Mount of Olives is where the Garden of Gethsemane was? Yeah, right, mm -hmm. on the slope of the uh, Mount of Olives, on the, uh, on the western side of the mount, yeah. So uh, that's where Jesus prayed. And that his reverence submission, of course, refers to, uh, refers to his, uh, not my will, but thine be done. Mm -hmm. And through this suffering, he learned what it means to be obedient to God. Because ultimately, then, like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shears is dumb, you know, so he opened not his mouth. And so Jesus learns obedience through the prayer at the Garden of Gethsemane and the suffering that, you know, was implicit in that whole process. And having been brought to completion, that word perfect is a yeah. little misleading. Um, it's like, you know, having come to the you know, to the ultimate point. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Because he was designated by God, a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So, kind of an interesting uh, passage, very hard to apply to us today. Having been made perfect means he completed his education or his... No, he experience. completed his, his, uh, his mission. His mission. Yeah. 
its mission in life to be offered up as a sacrifice mm -hmm. for the sins of the whole world. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and that's why at, on the cross in John's gospel, the final word is that it is finished, mm -hmm. you know, to tell us die. It's like, it's, it's all done, it's complete. Um, the document has been signed, so to speak. Or as we would say, signed, sealed, and delivered, right? The source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Again, being designated by God, a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is not suffering on the cross and suffering in Gethsemane and so on because he chose to do that. All right? It's because God chose to act through Jesus in that way. So, when one thinks about the, um, the, the original context of this passage, then uh, the writer of Hebrews is addressing that Jewish Christian community and was pointing out that you are familiar with high priests. Yeah. You know what the high priest does. He offers sacrifice on the Day of Atonement in the Holy of Holies. That's what the high priest does. Mm -hmm. And uh, he throws the blood uh, on the, uh, the altar, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, and only the high priest can do that. Yeah. In fact, only the high priest can go into the Holy of Holies. So now Jesus is being compared to that. And uh, of course the New Testament writers making it clear that Jesus is not just another high priest, but a high priest forever. So Jesus' sacrifice then, you know, is mm -hmm. good forever. Mm -hmm. You don't need a booster shot. <laughs> and then he sat down at the right hand of God. Yeah. yeah. And then when, when I was reading on Hebrews, a, a couple of different commentators said, there was no seats in the temple originally. There was no, nobody sat down. No. Because you're always working. But Jesus sat down at the right hand. Well, when everything was complete. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Once the sins, the sacrifice was made, mm -hmm. that was it. Yeah. And of course, it might be pushing it a little bit, but uh, keep in mind that when the rabbi sat down in the synagogue, it was in order to teach. Mm -hmm. That's so, true. Yeah. yeah, so when Jesus sits down at the right hand of God, uh, that is the beginning of Jesus' uh, ultimate message to the world. Yeah. Now, connections between this text and our contemporary setting. I don't know. <laughs> That's very tough. One, one point of contact, I, I think, is, has to do with uh, the whole question of suffering. When people suffer as individuals, or when uh, whole populations or uh, the church suffers, um, we are, in a sense, participating uh, in the suffering of Christ. In fact, Paul makes mention of that in one of his writings too, uh, that he's completing the suffering of Jesus, you know? Mm. Uh, and so there is a, a kind of a kinship of suffering. Um, one of the reasons Mother Teresa uh, so quickly became a saint in the Catholic tradition uh, is that uh, uh, she suffered with people. Yeah. Uh, not for them, in the way Jesus suffered on our behalf, but with them. Um, and alongside of them, you know, which again is like the paraclete who comes alongside, who is called alongside someone who is suffering. And so Jesus suffering, uh, Jesus understands our suffering. And so when you think about the suffering in the world today. And it's good to know that um, 
that God is sharing in, uh, in the experience that we are having when we suffer. God is not inflicting it on us. Um, God may be permitting suffering to happen, just as uh, a parent might permit a child to experience natural consequences mm-hmm. or something that they've done. When God invested us as humans with free will, that took that question out of the relative circumstance. We'll say more about that. Yeah. Well, if you don't have a free will, you are slave. You yeah. are subject to God's whims and, and desires and motivations. Herein, you are relegated to the context of being a human being and not being a God. And you can hope to achieve certain goals in your lifetime, mm-hmm. uh, but they will not turn you into God. Right, they don't make you God, but yeah, but you do experience you the, real, the real ups and downs of life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Improve. As a matter of fact, we were just talking about that this morning in my house about, which you know about, is the fact that I survived what should have been, which was a near-death experience. Yeah. yeah. And, and came through that. And my daughter still, she looks at me today and she said, I don't know how you can possibly survive that. Mm. And I, I don't myself to this yeah. day uh, know how that mm. all occurred. To me. I'm here. Yeah, well, the fact that you survived is on, is on this side of that experience. Mm-hmm. But during the experience itself, there was suffering. I mean, you, you know, there was some pain, there was yeah, some oh, loss, yes. there was there a lot was of pain anxiety, and fear, and all, the, all the negative aspects yes. of what one experiences sure. when they're going through sure. something like that, you yes. know? Yeah. Yeah, the suffering is real. Oh, yes. And I guess... Uh, you know, one might say that the lack of suffering uh, is not so much, uh, you know, the fact that somehow we are being rewarded for uh, good behavior, (laughs) you know. Uh, It is just because God is gracious and uh, merciful and so on. Um, But uh, we do experience suffering. And then the question is, you know, when we are experiencing suffering, how does that affect us in our relationship with God? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Because when we suffer in, in a very small way, we, we feel because of how much Jesus suffered. We can feel closer to Jesus because yeah. he was the man of suffering. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. We don't look at Jesus being, you know, the, the perfect one who did everything right and so on. who can't connect with us. Right. Just the opposite. We can understand, yeah, that he, um, you know, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Okay, I want to move on uh, to the gospel lesson, which is uh, uh, very significant. Uh, it's It was a gospel lesson that was used uh, as a gospel lesson for my uh, installation here oh. in this very room in which we are seated right oh and this was the sanctuary yeah this this was a sanctuary then and uh harold jansen who was assistant to the bishop uh eventually got around to preaching on this text uh he had a different sermon in mind when he came and uh when we read the gospel lesson he realized that there was a different gospel lesson from what he had prepared oh my <clears throat> so we so we got you no know, we just got an expanded sermon <laughs> so james and john the sons of zebedee came forward to jesus and said that teacher we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you and he said to them what is it you want me to do for you and he said to him grant, a, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory but jesus said to them you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. 
and the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the others, the ten, heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. Uh, the word is indignant. It's translated elsewhere. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as the rulers lord it over them. And their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So that's the, uh, the full text for this weekend. So it all starts out, it all starts out with this, uh, these two disciples of Jesus, James and John, brothers. They were, uh, you know, disciple number three and disciple number four, if you think about the story of how Jesus called disciples. So they're very much on the inside circle there. And, uh, you know, Peter, James, and John, those are the ones yeah, who went yeah. up in the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Yeah. yeah Andrew wasn't there. No, no. I no, was Peter, yeah. James, and John. <laughs> so these guys are really, you know, and, uh, you know, Jesus has already, in a sense, designated uh, Peter as, going, as the head. And so now these guys are saying, well, we're second and third. Yeah. So we'll sit at your right hand and your left. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, of course, uh, there's no reference to who would be on the right hand, who would be on the left hand, you know. So James and John had something that they could struggle with later on, but, uh, <laughs> but that's not the issue here. Um, but they, they want the status of being at the right hand of the one uh, I don't think when they he comes into his kingdom. Yeah, they, they don't know. No. The yeah. one who, and when he's in his glory, they, they want to be in the, that position of power yeah. and authority. You know? And, um, wow, it's, it's really, it's an amazing passage when you think about it. Because Jesus has been teaching about humility, and he's mm. already three times predicted it's the third prediction of his uh, uh, betrayal, arrest, uh, trial, crucifixion, and so on. He's already three times told them that this is what's going to happen to him. And uh, they still are thinking that Jesus is going to do something different. Mm. The story is going to be different. You know? And so uh, when you come into your glory, you want to be there on your right hand and your left. It's like, duh, weren't you listening? Right? Weren't you listening? You don't know what you're asking for. And he says, uh, you know, there's a cup I have to drink and there's a baptism that I will undergo. Uh, are you ready for that too? And of course they naively answer, we're able. <laughs> and then Jesus tells them the fact. Yeah, well, you are going to experience it. <laughs> oh, you're going to drink the cup, and you're going to be experience the baptism. You're going to be However, martyred. huh? You're going to be martyred. Yeah, right. You're going to experience the same suffering that I'm suffering. Ironically, of course, John is the one who is not uh, martyred oh, yeah. of, of all the twelve, yeah. but nevertheless, he participates in the suffering of Jesus. Yeah. To sit in my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but for those for whom it has been prepared. In other words, it's uh, it's the decision of God. It's not mm -hmm. my decision. Yeah. And that's not, I'm not getting into that. Uh, yeah. God the Father. Yeah. So let's see why is this not moving ahead on me. So the other disciples, the ten, they're angry with James and John. Not with Jesus, but James and John. 
He says, look, this is the way you are used to things. In the world where Gentiles are in command, and that's what they were, you know. In Israel, um, the Gentiles were the ones who were in charge. Romans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, right. Yeah. Uh, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them. And their great ones are tyrants over them. Mm. But Jesus is not understating it there. Jesus. You know, this is the way, this is the way things are in the world, Jesus is saying. But that's not God's plan. And that's not what's going to happen with us. Because the true greatness of God's people is experiencing uh, as they live as servants of others. Whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. That word servant and slave are the same word. Mm -hmm. So the um, biblical publisher or editor is uh, shifting it uh, for emphasis, I guess. The son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And that goes into the, that larger question that, you know, people, I guess we live in a world where there's reward and punishment and, and we are raised in families where if you do good, you, you get rewarded. And if you do bad, uh, you're going to have consequences. It's not really that way in the world, but that's the way we're taught mm -hmm. as children. You know, uh, you better watch out, better not ch uh, pout, better not cry, I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town, right? He knows if you've been that bad is, or good. That is a very interesting poem because it's not Santa Claus. In the original poem, yeah. it's called St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas, okay. St. Nicholas came down the chimney and he didn't wear a red suit. His clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. And he was a, a, a dwarf. But a small person. Yeah. Uh, and it, when you read that, it's completely different from a nursery home. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. If you read it in a different context, it's much humbler. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was a real person, St. Nicholas. Yeah. Saint yeah. Nicholas. Yeah. 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 Bishop of Myra. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 December 6th. It it's very detailed. It's a description of what St. Nicholas looked like. It's, it's a fascinating poem. It's, it's been one of the things my grandmother used to read it to me when I was a child mm. and, and try to explain it that Santa Claus that Coca Cola created yeah. is not real. That's, yeah. that's a product of consumerism. St. Nicholas was real. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in those days, you could come down the chimney because it didn't have a, it, it didn't have a trap. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, yeah. There was a window trap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> those days, they were they were a different type of fireplace. It was very shallow. It wasn't these big open pits that we have today. It was very shallow because you needed to make heat. It wasn't to be pretty like it is now. Yeah, yeah, so not that great. <laughs> Yeah. There's a name for it, and I can't remember what it is, mm. but it's a certain man's name who designed that fireplace. Mm -hmm. So what we, you know, so the idea, of course, is that someone knows if you've been bad or good, mm -hmm. and so you're going to be rewarded if you're good, but you're going to be, you know, you're going to get coal in your stocking. stocking. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. If uh, if you haven't been good, and so there are a lot of people who kind of think that way about God. You know, and they've kind of translated that into their theology. Yes. And they say, you know, that um, if you're good, you'll be rewarded. Yeah, if you're good, you'll be rewarded. And if you're not rewarded, it's because you've been bad. Right. You weren't good enough. Yeah, yeah. 
And, I have uh, to go, Father. Can we say yeah. something? Yeah, okay. Well, why don't we move ahead real quickly uh, to the final. We have a prayer. The prayer of the week. Sovereign God, you turn your greatness into goodness for all the peoples on earth. Shape us into willing servants of your kingdom and make us desire always and only your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Yeah, shape us into your willing servants of your kingdom. And that's a wonderful goal for all Christians uh, to be shaped by Christ, uh, to be willing servants in his kingdom. People who desire always and only to fulfill the will of God. So, yeah, we're done. And uh, next week uh, we have Jeremiah 31 and then Hebrews 7, 23 to 28. And Mark 10 continues uh, 46 to 52, the story of blind man Bartimaeus. Okay. All right. That's a, a good day. And uh, uh, thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Bye bye.